So just a little background, RIPT is a project supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And Janine Myers is our RIPT project officer. Then our um, RIPT uh, goal and purpose. Just a little second here. Our purpose of RIPT is designed to help strengthen organizational foundation in the key elements of value-based care, including but not limited to efficiency, quality, patient experience, and safety of care. And our goal is to guide small rural hospitals and certified rural health clinics not currently participating in value-based care through advanced alternative payment models to prepare for and position their organizations to be effective participants in a health system focused on value. We'd also like to share that we're currently accepting applications for RIPS 2024-2025 cohort. So if you're a small rural hospital or a certified rural health clinic that would like to participate in value-based care, please feel free to apply. Um, technical assistance for this project year will begin November of 2024, so this fall, and then we'll go through next August of 2025. And our application deadline is August 15th of, uh, so next month. We'll also have an informational webinar for anyone who would like to learn more about the services offered in RIPT and to hear stories from past RIPT participants regarding their time in the project. So you can register for this webinar coming up uh, next week on July 16th. And now I'm gonna welcome today's speakers. We have two speakers today, Lindsay Corcoran, a senior consultant, and Amy Graham, principal, and they're both from Stroudwater Associates. Lindsay is a senior healthcare consultant and the lead of Stroudwater's clinical and quality team. She brings over a decade of unwavering commitment to enhancing the success and sustainability of our nation's most vulnerable healthcare organizations. Her extensive expertise spans across hospital and medical practice operations, partnership opportunities, and clinical and quality improvement, all geared towards bolstering healthcare access in rural communities. Lindsay's dedication to supporting rural and community hospitals and clinics across the country has paved the way for improvements in operational and financial performance, ultimately enabling these organizations to better serve patient populations and communities' health and wellness needs. And Amy Graham, principal at Stroudwater Associates, is an experienced healthcare executive providing vision and direction in finance and revenue cycle and serving clients in the pharmacy, laboratory, hospital, and rural health clinic space. She's a leader with excellent communication and project management skills who has demonstrated the ability to manage teams, execute projects, and achieve results. Amy has over 20 years of experience in maximizing the accounting and finance and revenue cycle processes for healthcare organizations. Previously, Amy served as Senior Vice President of Revenue Cycle Management for a national laboratory. She also held the position of Director of Global Business Services and activities for health and wellness support, um, including pharmacy, vision, and care clinics for Walmart. So thank you both very much for speaking today. We're really excited for this topic and what you have to share. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand things off to both of you. Okay. All right, does that look okay? It does. Hey, Excellent. thank you. Every oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Molly and Rhonda, for inviting us to just come in and talk on this exciting topic. Um, actually, I like to call it exciting because we know that Medicare Advantage does cause some challenges out there. And there's been a lot of news about that. So we just want to say thank you for giving your time today and letting us just chat with you about it. So we go to just thinking about this presentation and what you're going to get out of it. The webinar, what we want to do is really talk about the distinctions of the Medicare Advantage, what its impact is on rural health care organizations, sharing with you the fundamentals of this plan. Like, what is it? You hear about it, but, you know, other than these insurance plans out there, how did this come about? Um, looking at how it can pose some challenges to both the patients and providers, um, and then discuss some strategies for what we want to do. And then you can see, you know, upon completion, what you should be able to do, um, interpret the distinctions between um, Medicare and Medicare Advantage, the challenges and opportunities, and some strategies out there. So that's our goal for today's topic. 
if we go to the next slide. We're going to kick it off and just do a Medicare Advantage one-on-one. -on -one. I like to get everybody on the same page so that when I talk about it and you're hearing it to make sure that, you know, we're speaking the same language. So let's first talk about Medicare. What is Medicare? Medicare is actually a federal legislation. It was enacted in 1965 under the Social Security Administration. Some of you might hear it called as Title 18 of the Social Security Act. You, you know, you hear a Title 18 out there. When you think about um, when someone completes their cost report, it might be referenced as that. And it typically does have that XVIII. That's how they refer to it when you look at legal documents and things like that. It's currently administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's CMS. So you hear about hear about CMS, it's under CMS guidelines, that's where this Medicare program, this legislation is administered. To be eligible for Medicare, you've got to be over 65, 65 and older, or you are disabled or have end-stage renal disease. Now, there are actually four parts to this legislation, and this is one of those things that I want to take a minute and just talk about them. If you hear about it, you might have heard Part A, they've got Part A, they've got Part B. And then sometimes you might hear about Part D, and then it's like, well, whatever happened to C? Part C is actually where Medicare Advantage came into play. Part A is within Medicare. It is that hospital-based services. If you're a critical access hospital, that could be where some of um, your outpatient services come, but primarily Part A is hospital inpatient. Part B is hospital outpatient. They are two different plans. Then you have Part D, which is separate from those other two. That's your prescription drug benefit. I sort of saying things that you might have heard in a commercial that comes about um, around October of every year. Sign up for Medicare prescription be drug benefit program. That was what they're referring to as part of this legislation that we typically call Medicare. Medicare Advantage, let's go to the next slide and look at it. Medicare Advantage, why do we talk about Medicare Advantage? Well, it's actually a health plan that's, a, that's offered by Medicare approved private companies. So you have private insurance plans that are out there. They're not government plans and they must follow Medicare rules. So within this, you have part A plus part B plus part D all combined together to become Medicare Advantage. Now, Medicare, that federal legislation program, actually pays the Advantage plan a fixed amount per enrollee. They don't pay on a claim basis. They pay for everyone who is signed up in their Advantage plan. They pay them a part, they pay them a fixed amount. The coverage that is provided by the Medicare Advantage plan must meet or exceed that part Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B coverage. So it must meet that same coverage or even exceed it. And then some plans actually include a Part D benefit. And then the enrollees, they must follow the rules that are established by the health plan. So if an enrollee, a person over the age of 65 signs up for this Medicare Advantage plan, they follow the rules established by that health plan. They are no longer following the rules established by Medicare. And so you hear, we'll talk about it in a future slide about the um, prior authorization. That is a rule that's being established by that health plan. And that's why you hear a lot of talk about that. Oh, I do want to say, if you have any questions about this information as we go along, feel free to also drop them in the chat box. Um, we're monitoring that information. So if you have questions as we're going through it, put that in there and then we'll have a question and answer session or section at the very end of the presentation. The next slide. So we've been talking about Medicare Advantage and you're like, wait a minute, why is this in the news so much? Why are we talking about this other than the fact that from a revenue cycle perspective, it's a little challenging to get paid. But if you look at the Medicare Advantage enrollment in 2020 or in 2010, only 25% of the eligible Medicare population was enrolled in an Advantage plan. 
what has happened now is that by 2024, that the information from the Kaiser Family Foundation is surveyed and they've said that over 54%, so it has doubled in size since 2010 to 51% in 2020, uh, 51% in 2023, 54% in 2024, and it's estimated that 60% of all Medicare eligible enrollees will have will be under an Advantage plan by the year 2030. So when you think about your organization and what that means to you, instead of these patients being traditional Medicare, that's typically how they refer to that Medicare Part A and Part B, instead of being traditional Medicare, they are now enrolled under these Advantage plan programs. Now, what does that mean for rural America? On this next slide, we actually give you a breakdown of the states themselves. And Lindsay, do you want to talk about what this, how this looks in those states? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so really, you can see the, the increase in the Medicare Advantage enrollment in rural. And rural here for this purpose of this study that was done by Chartist um, is any rural communities are defined as a county in which a rural hospital is located. Um, and so you can see enrollment in specifically in rural has increased 46% between 2019 and 2023. And in 10 states, which are the darker kind of greenish color, um, they've seen enrollment in Medicare Advantage uh, plans increase by more than 100% during that same time period. So there is significant penetration happening within rural communities all across the country. Um, and you can see in certain areas of the country, you know, it has that, um, that deeper penetration, if you will. Um, and then, you know, quite a few are in that 81 to 100% um, uh, in growth in enrollment of the Medicare um, Advantage plans in these rural, specifically to rural communities. So why, what makes these plans so attractive? Why are Medicare um, uh, beneficiaries kind of moving from off of traditional um, Medicare or maybe even just not even... In, thinking and enrolling in traditional Medicare. Um, Medicare Advantage has some perks, if you will. Um, they have increased, you know, benefits as it relates to some additional hospital, outpatient, pharmacy benefits. They Some offer dental and vision, which compared to Medicare, traditional Medicare, it's not something that is included. There's even, you know, fitness club memberships or discounts on, on various things. Um, items to purchase and wellness type um, activities. And that can be very appealing for folks in that newer Medicare beneficiary age cohort. Um, so folks, so, you know, very much they're into maybe more of the fitness and the wellness, and that might appeal to them a little bit more. Uh, so there's lots of different kind of benefits, I'm sure. Uh, maybe your your relatives, your family members have encountered um, some of these enhanced benefits um, with Medicare Advantage and very appealing to beneficiaries. Um, there's also a side, a, a financial side. Uh, there are plans that offer lower co-pays and then limited out-of-pocket um, expenditures. So uh, compared to the traditional Medicare, um, where there is a co-insurance for some, some types of services um, that are, you know, that the beneficiary may have to pick up. Uh, oftentimes, you know, some beneficiaries may be getting a secondary insurance to cover some of those. Um, you know, with these Medicare Advantage plans, there may not have to be a secondary insurance uh, to cover to cover some of those out-of-pocket expenditures. And I would say, Lindsay, on this slide, when thinking about those, that that financial advantage to going to Medicare Advantage, why they're going to this, they're on a fixed income now. The, mm -hmm. They are no longer in the workforce. They're in a retirement situation and looking at, okay, how are we going to budget it? And, you know, they make it very appealing to go to these Medicare Advantage plans. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I would have to say their marketing strategy is, <laughs> uh, you know, and we've all seen the commercials um, out there and, you know, you've likely had somebody come and knock on your door, you know, looking to enroll folks right then and there. 
um, you know, their marketing strategy to to get those folks enrolled um, is is quite quite yeah, intense. Yeah. It, it really is. You know, I always make fun of, you know, it's hard to say no to Tom Selleck on the TV, you know, because he, he is there and not pointing it. I couldn't tell you which one he's on, but I do know that he talks about it. And then also the services that those advantage plans, when those people are coming out and talking to them, it's like, oh, no, you know, they're telling them we don't get paid to do this. We want to explain all the benefits to you. And here are these different plans. Which ones do you want to choose? And you know, it does offer, you know, when you look at the benefits between part A, which is inpatient benefits, and part B, outpatient benefits, but then you also get, you know, dental and vision. Those are things that aren't part of medi the traditional Medicare right now. And then you throwing in the fitness clubs and all those added benefits really do make it um, appealing for that Medicare population. Absolutely. I had a hospital tell me, you know, their motto is don't let grandma sign up for Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> Medicare Advantage. Excuse Medicare me. Advan oh, yeah. you know, I'm like, oh, we might talk about that here. To be yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things about it is there is actually a med pack. You might have heard that phrase out there. That's the Medicare Advantage Program Annual Report. And so what this does is there is a group that goes out and looks at on an annual um, on an annual basis to see what is taking place within the Medicare program and that, that Medicare Advantage program. And so you can see that the share of the local market in the urban versus the rural market, that the largest insurer in the country has 49% of the work. So typically, or there are roughly eight insurers who insure all of the Medicare Advantage plans. And that local enrollment is generally concentrated in those by those top three insurers. So you can see this chart shows you how much penetration they have in that rural market. You've got one, you know, between one and eight plans that are in your area. And, you know, you may get more than that because there are others out there, but very concentrated with, you know, just the share of your business. And if you go and look at your patient population to see, you know, who are your top three payers, you know, you've got them listed out. And of those top three payers, are they advantage plans or are they commercial plans? And, you know, they really cover it at that local level as well. They're doing that marketing. They're doing that initiative and that strategy. And so this is just showing you the difference between what that market share is with payers. And it does cause some challenges out there because when you look and think, I'm in a rural community and I can't, you know, if I cut this, if I go out of network with this plan, what does that mean? You know, because 49% of my rural community is with, this one payer. So, you know, when looking at that and thinking about, you know, how many of those enrollees that eight cover roughly 80% of all of the enrollees that are out there as part of this report. So if we go to the next slide, you know, that just leads us into what is that impact on a provider basis? Because they're for that healthcare provider. And it's like, I try not to get on my soapbox, but man, I could quickly get on my soapbox. So keep me in check, Lindsay. When we start talking about these next slides, that when looking at the impact of Medicare Advantage and that you go into the next slide, Lindsay, when looking at Medicare Advantage, that what happens is that this is where I get if you ever talk to our colleague, Eric Schell, and listen to him talk about it, what he shares with everyone is that these Medicare Advantage program, when we say, don't let grandma, you know, don't let grandma sign up for Medicare Advantage. One of the things that is happening is that the Medicare Advantage payments that they are receiving are substantially higher than fee-for-service reimbursement. And that's the message that's trying to get out there, just showing that you know, looking at 2023 and 2024, that in the billions, it is 54% of that, of the payments that are over what is in fee-for-service is around coding. And I'm like, I step back and I'm like, wait, 
That's what the hospital's code. No, that's what the Medicare Advantage plans are coding. They're saying our patients have these comorbidities and they have these issues and these concerns. They're a sicker population. So Medicare, when you pay me per enrollee, you must pay me more because my patients are sicker. However, if we look on the pet provider side of the house, they're always pushing back saying, no, they're not that sick. They're pulling this information from their files and their, their data and sharing that with the plan. And then the advantage, then Medicare, the government is paying these advantage plans, these payments that are in total $88 billion more than what they would have paid under fee for service. And this is where the message that we're trying, you know, just wanting to share, we see it on the provider side. It's like, we're not getting paid by the advantage plans, but the advantage plans are saying to you, here are all the profits that we are making and here's what we're doing. And there are guidelines in place out there to, you know, watch for the quality measures and the five-star ratings and things like that. And so Lindsay's going to get into that here in a minute, but just wanted to share with you that, there is someone actually tracking the difference between what it would have been had it just been on fee for service versus these advantage payments that are out there. That, that is what MedPAC is looking at. And so going on to our next slide, there's been a lot of Medicare Advantage information in the news. And we just, you know, really pulled the, some headlines out there for you, looking at, you know, what's taking place. Um, the first one I want to highlight is that Arkansas a Hospital filed an underpayment complaint against United Healthcare. And you may be sitting in your hospital and in your clinic saying, wait, I'm in rule. Can I win? This was actually an article that was about a critical access hospital in Arkansas. I talked to the CFO about it and he's like, Amy, I was just fed up. I was done with it. They owed me $300,000 and I complained to CMS and CMS took action so that United Healthcare would pay us. That takes place. You do have rights under there. But then you can also hear about tensions that are taking place about manifestation, you know, with the hospital and that tension between the hospital and your Medicare Advantage plan. That tension that, you know, they want the patient to be sick, but they don't want to pay for the sick care, you know. And what does that look like? It's that it's a manifestation of a broken system. But then thinking about nearly half of the health systems, and this is all health systems that was reported in this one, that all health systems are looking, thinking about dropping, considering dropping certain Medicare Advantage plans. You know, why are they looking to do that? And what they're seeing is that the Medicare, the Advantage plans have to follow the rules that are in place for Medicare patients. And so if you don't have a contract that states to otherwise, they are responsible. There are out of network policies and, and procedures and guidelines that CMS has established for providers who don't work with these, who aren't contracted with these advantage plans. So you really want to think about that and say that may be a strategy that that may be a strategy that we can look at doing for our hospital because, you know, we're not getting paid and, and different challenges are out there. But then also to realize that CMS is putting things into place to put guardrails around. I said MedPAC was looking at that. They also have heard the concerns about Medicare Advantage prior authorizations, that it was targeted in a new bill, that there are new guidelines around that. And once that came out, now the legislation doesn't go into effect, unfortunately, until 2026. But once this legislation was put into or it was put out there into the marketplace, you heard immediately of one of the largest payers going, we have changed our prior authorization rules, getting ahead of these challenges that will come through, um, that will come through in the future. So, you know, they're getting ahead of it. They realize that they, being the Medicare Advantage plans, are trying to get ahead of these prior authorization changes that are coming forth in 2026. But we still have about a year and a half before that takes effect. So expect to see some additional news articles and press releases from these Advantage plans sharing how they have changed their prior authorization rules before that. 
All right. So thanks for leading up. So, you know, rip from the headlines, but now what are some of the challenges specific to rural? And uh, we can certainly probably pull this whole group here and you can likely um, either add to this list or just put a tally mark um, next to each one of these bullets here that you have likely experienced um, uh, with a Medicare Advantage plan for your organization. Um, we kind of uh, kind of thought about it in kind of two different buckets, you know, some of the financial impacts and challenges and some of the clinical operational, um, because we are seeing that and hearing it from our clinical quality folks as well. Um, and from an operational perspective. So, you know, really kind of running down from the financial side, Amy mentioned prior authorizations. And I think this one is the, the biggest kind of, I feel like we hear about prior authorizations the most because it it's impacting, it is multifaceted. You know, it is impacting on the uh, clinical and operational side, as well as the financial side. Um, where there's all these different requirements, these it's almost like we're in a circus and we're jumping through hoops to get you know a a prior authorization um, completed and and signed off on, and so we can provide that necessary care for those patients. Um, if some some of those prior authorization delays has restricted access to care and access to timely care for patients, um, which really has that downstream of impact on outcomes and, and health patient health outcomes, um, where if there is delays in care, um, which you've heard the, the stories um, that are out there, you know, where a prior authorization process took so long and it, you know, it, it delayed care and delayed timely care. Um, and it really impacted that patient. So um, payment delays uh, is certainly with that really is going to impact your overall revenue cycle performance of your organization. Same with claim denials and then having to go through that process of, you know, appealing denials. And that's timely. And it's also resource um, heavy, you know, that having to work your claim, your denials, having to go through those prior authorizations, it's resource heavy on an organization. Um, lots of administrative burden, uh, paperwork, documentation, various reporting, um, and that's really impacting and very challenging, especially for rural um, organizations where resources are so finite. Um, and, you know, having uh, low reimbursement rates for various services compared to maybe commercial payers or Medicare payers um, to healthcare organizations, disruption of the payer mix, you know, for so long, you know, our Medicare, Medicaid payer were, were the highest um, in our rural communities. And now that's really kind of offset with the the growth in the pen, in the increased penetration of Medicare Advantage plans. So there is that, you know, kind of disruption there in our, our longstanding payer mix. Um, some of the clinical operational challenges, certainly, again, as I mentioned, some of that access to care, um, you know, driven by those prior authorizations. Um, restricted provider networks, you know, so being whether, you know, these Medicare plans, um, you're enrolled, right? Like any commercial in-network, out-of-network, um, you may be referring a patient to a specialist, but that specialist is out of network for that Medicare Advantage plan. That really kind of limits that access um, to patient care and the coordination of, of patient care as well. Um, we mentioned the administrative burden, certainly. I, you know, and I would say the administrative burden on our providers too, where they're, you know, having to do work through the prior authorizations. They have to work through those appeals and those denials, um, you know, have to, you know, maybe change their documentation and their coding. And, you know, it, there's a lot um, outside of just direct patient care that providers are having to um, also manage and play a role in that and are certainly impacted by that. And then limited public available data um, on, you um, uh, Medicare Advantage, where, you know, uh, Medicare, if we look at utilization for Medicare, um, that's publicly available data. Uh, often, sometimes we can't always get Medicare Advantage, you know, utilization numbers or things like that that are publicly available, uh, similar to Medicare. So it kind of sometimes has an impact on um, planning, um, understanding our market better for more of the strategic decision making. So um, certainly there's, there's lots of challenges, um, but we just wanted to, you know, kind of talk through some of those. Amy, would you um, 
add anything else here for challenges? Yes, Lindsay, I, the thing that's really interesting to me about all of this is just that, you know, if the restriction and the administrative burden on that documentation and reporting, that's not just on the clinical and operational side. It's like, how many conversations do providers have to have when they've got a denial from, you know, it's not medically necessary. And it's like, hello, the patient's been sick, you know, and, and working with the providers to say, you know, can you have a discussion with, um, with this clinical person at the Advantage plan and to help them to understand, you know, why you made those decisions and working through it. And um, it's like all of these things just play into one another. But I think the one thing when you were talking about the limited publicly available data you know, for, like Medicare has that information available. It's whatever you can do on your level to collect the information that, that you've got um, and really start tracking and monitoring that, that can be used as a leverage for you um, in the future and what that looks like. So, you know, to when you're having those discussions, to even go to your patients and go, here's, you know, here's what we see and things like that. So if we go to the next slide, the next slide really talks about, um, you know, just impact by the numbers. And Lindsay, I'll let you share, you know, about these survey results. Yeah, so thanks, Amy. So the American Hospital Association did a survey and just kind of wanted to better understand the impact of Medicare Advantage plans and, and really was able to kind of tie some of those survey results to numbers. And I think the numbers certainly speak to that for themselves, and they're pretty staggering. Um, you know, you know, I'll just point out a few here. Um, you know, 95% of hospitals and health systems report increases in staff time spent seeking prior authorization approval. Um, we just mentioned you know, the administrative burden uh, that prior authorizations uh, can take up um, and having to kind of go through that process of, of gaining that approval for prior authorizations. And it is significant. And, um, you know, when we're already at our resource constraint, um, you know, having significant time um, increase in staff time spent doing this, you know, people having to hire additional FTEs when, you know, workforce challenges are out there um, just to support prior authorizations, it's, it's certainly a challenge. 84% um, report the cost of complying with insurer policies is increasing, uh, while 0% mm -hmm. say it's decreasing. So there's, it, it, <laughs> Having, you know, every single year you may have an update to your contract and, you know, your policies may be, you know, changing and, you know, the cost to have to comply with those changes is is a burden and has been uh, for a lot of these um, survey respondents here. 62% uh, of prior authorization denials and 50% of initial claim denials are being, are appealed are that are appealed are ultimately overturned meaning that there is <laughs> success happening um but you know we w question why was it denied or mm -hmm. uh, in the first place right so is it you know having to and think about the delay that's occurring on the prior um, authorization side and those claims denials one it's impacting patient care and two it's impacting you know the financial viability of our health system right if we're you know those claims are continuous getting continuously getting denied we're not getting those payments in um but then at the end you know it is overturned and there's success but having to work through that is again the time and the resources mm -hmm. um that we don't have and then lastly, you know, 78% of hospitals and health systems report that their experience with commercial insurers is getting worse, and those are Medicare Advantage, while less than 1% said it's getting better. So real low number, real, you know, I would have to say, you know, out in the industry, right, in um, whenever we bring up a, a Medicare Advantage plan, it's not talked about favorably. Um, <laughs> And we can sense the stress um, and, you know, the it, the the stress level just continuously increasing um, over time. 
uh, and we've we felt that as, as well. Um, so so we hear you, uh, and we know you know that this is this is a significant challenge for a lot of our um, rural uh, organizations. And I was going to say the one thing about the impact. No, go into the next slide too with the impact on the on rural is that a lot of these denials and things that take place. One of the reasons why they're being overturned is because. Denial that these insurance companies have AI tools in place. They've set up requirements that say if it meets this certain criteria, the bot says, nope, it doesn't match and rejects the claim and hoping that you're not going to fight it. And so when you when you look at these AI tools and, and machine learning that's been developed, you know, that's one of those opportunities with the impact to rule that. Rule does not, I, I did a poll, someone asked me, Amy, you know, is anybody using revenue cycle using AI tools within their revenue cycle? And I couldn't find anyone. And I surveyed lots of, lots of people out there in various states. And, you know, so if you hear, you know, if you know of someone who is using an AI tool in to help with revenue cycle would love to have a discussion with them because that's what the advantage plan is saying is that they um they've got or that's what people are saying is that the advantage plans the payers they're tonight they've got those ai tools in place and we just need something on the back side to help you work it and then also um you know to keep in mind the opportunities, and Lizzie, I'm going to skip ahead and talk about the financial side of this. It's that the Medicare Advantage plans must reimburse the hospital the Medicare rates if there's no contract with the facility. So if you are not contracted, we were talking a minute ago about not getting out of network with the plan. If you are out of network, they have to reimburse you your cost-based rates. Your rate letter that you got from Medicare, that's what they should be paying you. If you have a contract that that rule does not apply, you follow the contract. So the contract supersedes the Medicare legislation. However, these two CMS policies that are here are the CMS policy has an FAQ and does have, you know, what you need to do and that providing that legislation, that CMS policy to those advantage plans to say, I'm out of network with you. Your, your enrollee has received care. They are a Medicare eligible patient. It's a Medicare Advantage plan. You must follow Medicare rates. And so I know that there have been, when I talked to that Arkansas hospital, he's like, Amy, we were out of network. They had to pay us. That's why they paid us that money because they could prove that they had reached out to them and communicated that information. So, Lindsay, you want to talk about the operational side, the opportunities that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a few things that have happened, you know, um, well, it, that could be an opportunity. Uh, if you're a hospital or an organized healthcare organization in Texas, you may have heard about the uh, Texas gold card bill, um, which is really focused on prior authorizations, reducing that prior authorization burden and delays in patient care. Meaning that any provider that has, you know, this 90% um, prior authorization rating, so basically, you know, over six months, if there hasn't been a need or a denial in a pr prior authorization for certain services, then they get exempt from having to do prior authorizations for certain services, and they receive this gold card. Um, there's been lots of kind of scuttle about really does it is is it working? Is it really um, reducing that prior authorization burden? But it is, you know, the fact that we want to kind of give credit that there is movement and progress being made to really, you know, understand what's driving and what are, you know, those impacts and those challenges to healthcare organizations uh, because of some of the stipulations around Medicare Advantage. So, that's just one example. Um, this could be something that gets deployed. Um, we'll talk about some of the changes that are happening in the next slide, but um, from the federal perspective, um, then there's also, you know, an, op an opportunity to consider is, you know, as that prior slide had showed, you know, getting some decreased reimbursement rates and, you know, declines in, in reimbursement rates from some of the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, 
is there opportunity to enter into additional kind of value-based payment arrangements and, and recognizing alternative payment models to kind of overcome some of those losses um, on the Medicare Advantage side? And, you know, that's something to, to maybe consider as, a, as an opportunity for, for rural um, healthcare organizations. Um, some of the additional changes that have hap are happening coming forth um, is a few things that you may have uh, heard um, in the news. Um, the first one being the um, Timely Access to Care Act. Um, this was passed um, and it's something I think, Amy, did you mention it wasn't until 2026? 2026, yes. Six. Um, but this is really around those that those prior authorizations and kind of combating those prior authorizations. The bill kind of outlines um, that there would be this establishment of electronic prior authorization standards to kind of streamline that referral of that approval process. Um, reduce the amount of time a health plan is allowed to consider a prior authorization request. So putting some time kind of bands around this. Um, require uh, Medicare Advantage plans to report on their use of prior authorization and the rate of approvals um, and denials. And lastly, to encourage um, Medicare Advantage plans to adopt policies that adhere to evidence-based guidelines. So when you think about clinical practices and, you know, a lot of times we uh, utilize some type of evidence-based guidelines um, that, you know, but then, you know, those Medicare Advantage plans, you have to prior authorize to even move through that evidence-based guideline, um, which then delays that care, um, that timely and effective care. So um, adhering to those, those evidence-based guidelines would, would prevent some of that uh, prior authorization to impede on uh, timely and effective care. Um, and then lastly, this one here is star rating. So this one has been definitely in the news um, most recently. And similar to star ratings that we see for quality, right? Um, for, you know, your H caps and for hot um, home health and nursing home, we have star ratings for the quality of care given to Medicare beneficiaries, um, Medicare Advantage beneficiaries. And so, you know, basically it's a, the program looks at um, 40 clinical um, measures and member experiences and administrative and quality services. And ba based on how they rank and how they do, um, with the on these 40 different measures, they can be awarded a 5% bonus um, if they learn, earn at least five or four stars. Um, and so there's been some changes in the methodology um, and that has impacted and Medicare Advantage plans are not so happy about some of that, those changes. And that's reduced some of those bonuses that they, they um, are receiving. And they end up kind of reallocating those lost funds to um, those uh, it, beneficiaries. And so, you know, they're, you know, having to raise premiums and things like that to offset those lost bonuses. So lots of things happening um, as it relates to Medicare Advantage. And I want to just put a caveat, you know, this is what we see in the news today, right before this presentation. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow, it might be totally different because I think uh, everything is changing quite rapidly um, as it relates to some of these Medicare Advantage um, uh, plans. Uh, I was going to say that was one of the challenges for putting this together is that the information could change as of tomorrow. So, you know, it's just what's taking place. So really, we wanted to provide to you some strategies just, okay, it, we've got to wait until 2026 for prior authorizations to change. We've got a lot of um, activity happening in our marketplace. What do we need to do? And what type of leverage, what kind of, uh, you know, what can you do today? Practical strategies for just managing it within your state. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. And really, the one thing I would say is to hold the payers accountable. You know, just really 
you are, you know, you can hold them accountable for what's going to take place. So in 2026, with prior authorizations, you know, non-urgent prior authorizations have to be done within seven days, and urgent requests are within 72 hours. That's something to look forward to. Um, you know, just those are changes happening. The one thing I would say is do not give away your Medicare rates. Don't, you know, if you want to, if you want to be in network and contract with these plans, make sure that the reimbursement that they are providing to you is the same or more than what your Advantage plan, or what your CMS cost-based reimbursement is. Don't give away those Medicare rates through payer contracting. Um, we, thinking about, you know, your um, swing bed days, making sure that your swing bed days are at that Advantage plan or not, are at that CMS rate letter rate. Don't give that away because they do have to follow it. And you can use the leverage of, if you don't want to contract with me at this rate, then you're going to have to go out of network and receive this rate, working through that. And then really foster a sense of accountability with reviewing their performance, you know, their performance on key indicators and targets. Have those monthly discussions. Do you even know who your rep is for your largest plan in town? And so, you know, what is what does that discussion look like? Do you know who they are? And, you know, can you have that discussion with them? And when you have that discussion on the next slide, we share with you, here are some things to talk to them about. You're like, well, what do I talk to them about? The first one, denial reporting. Monitor what claims they are denying. The dollar value to the total build of claims, you know, because they've got a rate. If you want to know what's going on in that plan, they've got a rate as to what their percentage of payment is on claims. They know what their denial rate is. And if you come back to them and say, here's the total number of claims that we bill to you and how many you're denying, you're doing a, a really bad job at this, you know. And then looking at your denial and the number of claims submitted to the payer. If you have a contract with them and you think, oh, look, they're paying me 200% of charges, but they deny 99% of those claims, is it really a great contract? You know, going back to them and saying, what can we do to decrease the number of denials, to decrease the fact that my, my staff has to go out and fight every single one of these. We have to bill you twice before you pay us for the services. Really looking at prior authorization, you know, what's the process? Do you have a process in place? Is there a lag time? What's the automation? Really pushing for that automation. Looking at medical necessity. How many medical records requests do you get? What is the appeals process? When I say they've got AI tools out there, they're looking to see, do you have your diagnosis codes to the greatest level of specificity? Because um, in talking to a, a colleague of mine, they were talking, going, yep, when we talk to these plants, if it is an unspecified diagnosis, um, they're automatically denying that off the top of the, off the bat. They're denying the claim and sending it back. And then really the overall success of that pair. What is the financial health of that contract? Are you getting paid? You know, take those claims and bump them up against what it would be if you were getting paid by, by your rate letter. Is it a healthy contract or not? Um, you know, those are things to look at when thinking about the success of the payer and how to hold them accountable. Just go in with these four items and say, even denials, go back and go, we need to fix this and hold them accountable until that number changes. Because if they're using an AI tool to deny your claims, they can fix that AI tool to allow the claims to go through. If you think of it that way. So just a whole, you know, and sharing with them that our option is going out of network and you will pay me full rate. So those are just some indicate, you know, indicators to look at and a whole targets for holding them accountable. Um, looking at that. So at this point, I think we're to the end of our the presentation of our material, and we really just want to hear from you. I know that we've had a lot of um, questions coming through and really want to open it up for discussion with you. Um, you know, are you, you know, are there some changes or challenges that you're facing? Um, 
and or are there any workflows that you've had to put into place to account for this new Medicare Advantage plan that you've got in place? And then thinking about has it impacted the patient care? What are those items out there? So with that, Lindsay, I'm gonna turn it over to you and or um, to Molly and Rhonda to see if we have any questions out there. Yes, we do have um, a couple of different questions here. Um, Amy, do you know if there's a resource that lists all the MA plans and benefits available in a zip code that patients could use to select a plan? Not off the top of my head. I don't, um, I know that people, I'll have to look into that and let you know. I haven't seen anything out there, but happy to look into that. Yeah, I'm wondering if, you know, like you go to United Health Group or, you know, and then they probably list available MA plans within a certain group. I'm, I'm thinking that there might actually be something on CMS under patient resources. They have a... Um, they have a very robust patient portal on cms.gov and then they can go to the patient section and it, it will help them work through some of those questions that are out there. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, then we did have um, a uh, question. We did have, um, we had a hospital in, um, I don't know where they are, but we received a notice of termination from a large MA plan where we're contracted with and hearing it is because they want out of rural markets. MA plans do not want to play, pay cost-based reimbursement. Anyone else experiencing that? Um, we did have a hospital in Louisiana also say that an MA plan canceled, uh, sent a cancellation letter to their critical access hospital. They're challenging the letter um, indicating that they would have to pay us their Medicare rate, even if we were out of network. So that's, you know, they're, they're working on that. Um, but also, um, who would we report a complaint to? Um, is, if, with, with re reporting that complaint, I believe that within that out of network policy is a link to the CMS site to file that complaint with CMS. Um, and, you know, there as part of um, an FAQ, it was listed as part of that as well. Great. And then are Medicare Advantage plans required to play cost-based reimbursement for swing beds in critical access hospitals since this is traditional Medicare rate? Um, it They are required to pay that Medicare rate in the swing beds as well, yes. And then if you have a rural oh, health wait, let me let me just step back. If okay. they're out of network, if they're in the if you are if you were contracted with that plan, you have to they'll pay you whatever your contracted rate is. So you want to make sure that your contract is higher, at least at Medicare rates. And we have a lot of plans that don't even cover swing bed services. So that also um, can impact, you know, um, your swing bed, certainly your swing bed volume. Um, and also have different stipulations to on swing bed services, right? They may, you know, outside of Medicare, you know, where you have so many skilled days, they would um, maybe only give you 10 skilled days. And then you'd have to go through another whole prior authorization to get additional. It's um, and, so. and Lindsay, I hear stories about that all the time where it's like, oh, they're taking seven days to get authorized to be in a swing bed. And it's like, well, by that time, you know, it's like they found another place for, you know, or they, there are challenges with getting that prior authorization to get them in the bed. And then they come back later and say, it's not medically necessary for them to be in the skilled level of care. Um, those are some of the challenges that rural providers face with those swing beds. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, we have a question from a rural health clinic. If your rural health clinic rate changes annually, how do we negotiate that? I'm sorry, ask that again. I missed that. If your rural health clinic rate uh, changes on an annual basis, how do you kind of negotiate that with an MA plan? What you should be doing for all of your MA plans is sending that rate letter to them. The minute you get it, you turn around and send that communication 
to your Medicare Advantage plans, letting them know that that is um, that your newest updated rate and they should be paying it. There, there are some plans just giving you a heads up on it. Some plans may only want to pay you um, from when they get the letter. So you want to get the letter as soon as possible to them. Um, but then also as part of the legislation that's out there, um, the, the CMS guidance on your rural health clinics does state that it goes up by the Medicare Economic Index every year. That's already published, and it does go into effect on January 1, but you'll need to get that rate letter from your MAC and um, your Medicare administrative contractor for your state, and then can provide that information to them to get them to pay it. Oh, and what I was saying is, they will quickly change it if it's in their favor. And if it's not in their favor, it does take a while to get it through, unfortunately. And then our last question, and I, it, you'll probably see the poll up here on your screen. So while we're talking, if you wanna complete that poll, that'd be great. Um, we have our MA plans allowed by CMS to negotiate contracts that don't include coverage for all traditional Medicare services. I'm going to have to research that my, uh, from my understanding that they have to, at a minimum, the Medicare Advantage plans have to provide the coverage provided by yes. traditional Medicare. That's my understanding, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, Molly, I think we're going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you both. This was really good information. And it, um, again, I, I know people have been waiting for information like this, so we really appreciate it. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining. Like Lindsay said, there are some post polling questions up on your screen if you wouldn't mind just answering those. Um, a couple of reminders before you jump off and I'll keep, I'll keep monitoring the chat if you have any questions. Um, so within about five business days, we'll send out the recording and the slides. So if you wanna share this information, you can do that. Um, we'll provide you with the link to our short online evaluation. I'm actually gonna put the um, the eval if you need ACHE credits in the chat. Um, and then we'll send you a follow-up email and that's really it. So thank you everyone for, for joining today. Please reach out to the RIP team if you have any follow-up questions, if you have any questions you'd like us to pass along to the speakers. Um, this is really great information. Thank you, Lindsay and Amy. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Lindsay and Amy. Everybody have a good afternoon.